What's cracking, YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. As always, it's your boy Nicholas. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. We're looking forward to week six. Five weeks into the season, it's about a third. It's about 33.347%. But who's counting? It's gonna be a good day. I'm drinking coffee out of my poop emoji glass. You know the deal for my videos, my weekly videos. We're going through key injuries, we're going through wide receiver cornerback matchups, we're going through must starts, must sits, sell high, buy low. Or Yeah, we got that right for the first time in about four weeks. So I don't want to take too much time out of the intro. I want to get right into the content so I can wrap this up and get it out to y'all. Before we get into the video, make sure you are, well one, make sure you give this video a thumbs up if, if you've enjoyed the videos I've been putting out, if you enjoyed the content I've been putting out. Make sure you're following me on Twitter. Also make sure you're subscribed to my newsletter on my website because whenever I drop my weekly waiver wire sheet as well as uh, the murky running back situation blog post, I send out an email to you guys. So make sure you go over to bdgeat.com, scroll down, put your info in, you'll be signed up for the newsletter and I'll hit you with emails every week. None of that spammy shit, I'm not here to advertise to you guys. I just wanna get my content out as efficiently as possible. So go sign up for the newsletter, go follow me on Twitter, let's get into some key injuries. First off, honestly, we might have to do an entire video on the New York Giants injury report. We had OBJ with an absolutely heartbreaking ankle injury, fractured his ankle, I own OBJ in two of my four money leagues. This one hurt, man. This is like, hit me right in the heart, hit me in the, in the soul. That's what it was. It was like, you know when you're at a party and you're drunk, or not you're drunk, but someone else is drunk and they're like so drunk to the point you're looking and you're looking at their eyes, right? And like, they're physically there, but you're really looking at their soul. Like they're not looking at you, right? I think that was like the look that came over my face when they showed the replay and his ankle hit the floor. I was like, oh, I was shook. I'm still shook. I'm pissed off. Either way, fantasy analysis. OBJ's out. Brandon Marshall also out for the year. Sterling Shepard luckily got good news and his ankle injury is not supposed to be serious. What does this mean for the Giants wide receivers, right? Shep will be the easy wide receiver one there. He's proven he can, you know, make plays for this offense, and he's obviously the most talented guy there. They have Traveris King they pulled up, or they re-signed. They have Roger Lewis, who scored a touchdown last game. Neither of those guys are guys you really want to pick up, especially not for this week. They're going against Denver, probably. Like, they couldn't have had a worse matchup coming off of how the injuries happened to them last week. Now they go against Denver, who have obviously a great pass defense and now the best rush defense in the NFL. So you don't really want anyone in this pass offense besides Shepard and Evan Ingram right now. And you probably don't want to start anyone in week six. So what I would say going forward is Shepard should be just based off volume, a solid wide receiver three, probably a wide receiver two. I'm sure he's going to get a ton of end zone looks. You look back to rookie year, right? He got a lot of the end zone looks, even while OBJ was there, even well, they had other targets on the team. So that should be like a big part of their game plan if they can get down there. So I like Shepard. If you got him off the waiver wire, that was definitely a good pickup. Evan Ingram should see a boost also. Um, Paul Perkins did not practice either. He's still dealing with the injury. So that would probably leave um, Gallman. I think Darkwish should be good to go. He, he kind of left the game last week as well. But they'll still be a running back by committee in my opinion. Gallman looked good. Uh, but Darkwa has also been running really well this year. He's averaging, I think, like 5.7 yards per carry on, on limited touches. But I'm just saying before we go crazy on Gallman, they probably still will use a, a, a committee between Gallman, Darkwa early down, goal line, and then Vereen on passing downs. But it's good to see that Gallman has like a three down ability going forward. Um, either way, you're not starting anyone against Denver this week. Look at Travis Kelsey. Possibly the longest concussion protocol of all time on Sunday. Or did they play Monday? I think they played Sunday. Either way. Got a concussion, or was in the concussion protocol. They cleared him. And then when they went back in the locker room, he said he was like forgetting things. And I guess that's how brain injuries work. Now he's in the concussion protocol. He has a concussion. He didn't practice on Wednesday, which is not good. Because he needs to be cleared. He needs to work through the protocol by Sunday when they play. So if you have Kelsey... Obviously, if he's cleared, you're firing up. If not, you need a backup plan. You need to make sure you have another tight end because you never know how these concussion protocols 
you know, could work. He could be cleared by tomorrow. He could not even be cleared by next week. So have a fill-in if you have Travis Kelsey. Devin Funches, practice on Wednesday. He'll be good to go Thursday night against Philly. Uh, fire him up. You know, he's been very, very hot. I think he's like wide receiver four in fantasy over the last two weeks. Cam Newton looks like he's fully back. He's looking really good utilizing Funches and Benjamin on the outside. So Funches is a, a low wide receiver two, high end wide receiver three against a struggling uh, Philly secondary on this Thursday night matchup. We have Carlos Hyde. You know, I wrote about a lot of these guys. You know, the injuries lead to waiver wire pickups. So a lot of the breakdown I say here, you can just go look at my waiver wire sheet that has a lot of the breakdown. Clearly, I think Carlos is. Carlos Hyde's hip is bothering him. There's no way that they actually think Matt Breida is more talented than Hyde. Hyde's been a beast this year, right? When you give him the ball, when you give him the work, he's been able to produce, and there's no way they're just going to feed the hot hand here, even if Breida's been performing well. In my opinion, Carlos Hyde is hurt. The coach came out and said, uh, it had nothing to do with injury. It's more the hot hand. I mean, obviously, you're going to say that. You don't want to let other teams know that he's injured because, therefore, one, they're going to start targeting his hip and where it hurts. And two, they, you know, they'll game plan for – now they have to game plan for both guys because you don't know if you're going to get Hyde or Brita. So it sounds like more coach speak to me. Brita's definitely a handcuff you want to have if you're a Hyde owner. But uh, I, I still think – Hyde is fine for an RB2 if he is, uh, if he's ruled, you know, active and he's going to be playing. You know, Washington defense, that's who they get in week six. They've, they let up a touchdown to Le'Air Blunt. They let up two touchdowns to Todd Gurley. They let up 100 yards to Kareem Hunt last week. So they're a good rush defense, but it's not like um, a good running back like Carlos Hyde can't produce. So if Carlos Hyde is playing this week, I want him in my lineup. And we have the Titans. Mariota, they're saying he's a, definitely a game time decision. It sucks because it's a nice matchup against Indy, obviously, but they play on Monday Night Football. So if by you know Sunday, you first of all you need another uh, contingency plan, right? You need another quarterback on your lineup because you don't want to risk going into Monday night and then having to play Matt Castle. Jo Jacoby Brissett is definitely someone available on your wire that I would love to stream. He was like my number. He's my number. One, I'll he's my number one streamer, but I'll talk about him later. So that's something you could do if you're waiting on Mariota, pick up Brissett, and you could play either one of them uh, on the Monday night slate. If Mariota goes, obviously you want him. If not, Brissett's fine this week to play. And with Corey Davis, same thing. They're saying he's close to returning. Could mean anything. At this point, if you've held him for this long, I feel like you could, you probably should hold on to him. But if you need someone else, you can go pick him up at this point because we really don't know um, if he's going to be back this week, if it's even going to be next week. It could be two or three weeks down the line. The hamstrings are never a good thing to, like, to presume. So the Jets' backfield. So Bilal Powell left the game with a calf injury. He didn't practice on Wednesday. So, I mean, at this point, it's looking doubtful. One of the uh, New York, I think, I don't know if it was a poster, another New York Times or, I don't know, something said that they don't expect Powell to play and they expect Elijah McGuire, the rookie back, who came in and was basically the featured back when Powell left last week, to handle a big workload. They, they expect him to get, like, almost all the work. So if Powell's out, you would assume that for McGuire. But then Roto World had a blurb today that said Forte was actually seen with his helmet on at practice. And that's the first time we've seen that since since the toe injury that he had, right? That's kept him out for the last couple weeks. If McGuire's the only running back playing, obviously they're going to have practice squad or another guys behind him. But if Powell or Forte, if Powell and Forte both sit, you're firing McGuire up as like a surefire RB2 against the Patriots this week. They're really bad against uh, running backs. They're letting up a ton of fantasy points. McGuire has proven that he can catch balls. He can run the ball. So he'll probably be their three down feature back. And the Jets are going to be trailing, right? I think they're like 10-point uh, underdogs at home. So I think that's really good for McGuire in like PPR formats. I think he should get like four to five dump-offs in this game along with 12 to 15 carries. So I'm really comfortable with him as my RB2 if both of these guys miss the game. If one of them plays, then you have to obviously pull back on the reins here. They said if Powell plays, they expect him to be like not a decoy, but definitely limited. So if Powell or Forte plays, I'm probably staying away from the backfield altogether. If, if it's Forte that <clears throat> plays, I'm probably okay playing McGuire um, because I don't I don't know. I feel like they're they're still going to hold back on Forte and McGuire will get the blunt of um, the workload. It's kind of a tricky situation. We've got to wait to see how Powell and Forte kind of pan out for this week. Devontae Parker, day-to-day -day with a, a minor ankle injury. They said it's supposed to be minor. I'm more concerned, obviously, with this offense overall and, and Cutler. They got a tough matchup with Atlanta this week. I think Parker's going to play. I think he'll be fine.
but he's going to see a lot of Trufant, a lot of Robert Alford. They've been a, a good pass defense against outside uh, receivers, like someone like Parker. So for this week, I think you have to downgrade him to like a wide receiver three, probably like a, a mid to low wide receiver three, even like flex and PPR leagues. But you look at like prior to week five, right? He left last week really early in the game. It was like one catch he had or one target. But you look at the three games prior, right? Because they missed week, they didn't have a game week one. So they've had three games so far this season. And through three games, Parker's had 18 catches on 27 targets, 230 receiving yards and a touchdown. If you pace those games out, to a full season, that's 96 receptions, 1,230 receiving yards, and over five touchdowns on 144 targets. So I know it's a small sample size of three games, but I'm just saying even in a struggling offense, this is what Parker is pacing out to have. So he might even be a buy low candidate. I didn't put him as one of my buy low guys in this particular episode, but just think of those numbers, and that's the kind of numbers he was, you know, no one really... Uh, he hasn't had like an explosion game, right? He's been at like 60, 70, 80 receiving yards, only a touchdown. And he's been like nine targets, eight targets, 10 targets. So he hasn't had an explosion game. So no one's like, oh, wow, Parker's going crazy. But he's been very, very consistent on a week to week basis. And that over the course of the year is obviously going to make him a very top rated uh, wide receiver. So he could definitely still be a wide receiver three, wide receiver two going forward as long as he's healthy. Uh, and Terrence West left the game with a calf injury. They said it's minor and he's not supposed to miss extended time, but that could mean anything from this not missing this game to two to three weeks, right? They signed Bobby. I think it was Bobby Rainey. Let me check real quick. They signed someone from the practice squad or off someone else's practice squad. Yeah, they signed Bobby Rainey, which probably means that they're going to need RB depth, right? It could be insurance, but it's probably saying that they, they expect Terrence West to be out. With Terrence West out, Buck Allen took over, right? I saw like 20, 23 touches or something like that in the game. Alex Collins only had 12 carries. I mean, I'm still, I'll talk about this in my sell high place, but I mean, Buck Allen's going to be a very good start for this week against Chicago if Terrence West is out. He should see uh, 18 plus touches. Alex Collins should be getting more work. He's clearly the most talented back there for me. S over seven yards of carry compared to Buck Allen's like 3.5, but the coaching staff clearly trusts Buck Allen not to fumble the ball with the in-between tackles kind of shit. I don't know. He's not the most efficient, but if Terrence West miss, misses time, Buck Allen is like a clear RB2 for the time being, even though I think eventually it'll play itself out. But who, who am I, right? Uh, lastly, Charles Clay, torn meniscus, sprained MCL, expected to miss about a month. The hits keep coming for this offense, man. And I talked about this in my waiver wire sheet. Nick O'Leary is like a quiet pickup here. They have a week six bye, so probably no one is going to be picking him up, right? But with this is per um, per someone on Twitter. I forget who. If you want to look at the reference, go to my waiver wire sheet. I think it was John Daigle or something like that. With Clay out last week, Tyra Taylor threw 25 passes. Nick O'Leary, their backup tight end, saw seven targets of those 25 passes, which is a 28% target share. So that's right around what Clay was getting. So if you know if Clay's out, Jordan Matthews is still going to be out a couple weeks. They need to throw the ball to someone, and they have really good matchups coming off the bye. I think it's like Tampa Bay and then like uh, New Orleans and and a bunch of really good passing matchups. So Nick O'Leary could be a really quiet PPR fill, and he's not like very athletic or explosive, but he has good enough hands to catch the the target numbers that he's going to get. And if he's around where Clay was getting, he should be getting you know five like five fifty stat line something like that. So. Charles Clay out a month sucks, but there are things you could do to temper it. And you know what? Moving past the injuries, I think that was all the injuries I had on the list today. If, if I missed any, I apologize, and I'll, I'll try to write them down below. Oh, Kenny Brick returned to practice on Wednesday. He sat out week five. He's now on track to play against Sunday. Uh, Kevin Hogan is starting, so that's a bump to David Njoku because two of his three touchdowns has come from Hogan. Ricardo Lewis was getting a ton of targets these last couple weeks, so it's a downgrade to him, which kind of sucks because I picked him up in like a 14-team league to flex, my second flex, whatever. I'm just rambling now. Uh, wide receiver cornerback matchups. You guys know I make this video on Wednesday, but the Pro Football Focus wide receiver cornerback sheet doesn't come out till Thursday. So what I always, what I normally do is I wait till that comes out, then I re, then I uh, film another piece of this video on Thursday morning, put it into this re-edit it, and then put it out. What I'm going to do from now on, what I did last week was I did the wide receiver cornerback matchup section as a blog post, 
And I hope you guys, are you guys cool with that? Because it's a lot easier for me to be able to just get this video out in one cut and not have to wait. And you know, it cut, I can do it on Wednesday nights now and get it out or Thursday really early mornings and get it out to you guys rather than, you know, it, it takes me a, a lot more time to wait on it, then do the wide receiver column and then get it out rather than me being able to just do a blog post for that. So if you guys are cool with that, I'm gonna do that going forward as well as this. So if you wanna see the wide receiver cornerback matchups, I will do a blog post for it on Thursdays. I'll release it and I will put the uh, link to the wide receiver cornerback matchups blog post in the description of this video where you'll find everything else, my website, my Twitter handle, all that kind of stuff. So I'm gonna do that rather than uh, inserting it into the videos from now on. So hope y'all are cool with that. If you've enjoyed the video so far, do me a huge favor, scroll down a little bit and give the button a thumbs up as well. If you're new to the channel, subscribe, baby. So we're coming at you all mother fudging gear. All right, we're gonna get into some must starts. For the must starts, I'm gonna pick a quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end that I like this week that I feel like you should definitely be getting into your lineup. And the first one is a quarterback and I mentioned him earlier quickly in this video and it's Jacoby Brissett of the Colts. And like I said, if you're a Mariota owner, this is the perfect quarterback to pair with him for this week because you won't have to choose if Mariota is out. It's a Monday night football game. Now, Brissett's been very, dude, you look at the trade they made. They traded Philip Dorsett for Jacoby Brissett. Hats off to Indy, man. It's crazy because what are the Colts right now? Are they two and two? They two and three? Two and three. They get Tennessee with possibly without Mariota. Very winnable game for them. They could very well be three and three with Andrew Luck probably like right around the corner from returning. Imagine he came back to this team and they're three and three. Like they're very much in the hunt with Houston. Their defense just got destroyed by injuries. Uh, Tennessee is going to be a good challenge for them, and Jacksonville is up in the air. This is a this in, this very quickly turned into a super interesting division. So Jacoby Brissett, um, he, he only has two t uh, passing touchdowns on the season, but he's proven that he can that he's a lot better at least than what I projected him to be. He's, he threw for a season high 314 passing yards on just 22 completions in Week Five against against the Niners. Him and T.Y. Hilton, his number one wide receiver, are really, really starting to connect. You saw Hilton go off for 177 yards. He's feeling more comfortable hitting him with deep balls left and right down the sidelines and everything, which is always good, obviously. And they're gelling like Paul Mitchell over there. Could have had an even bigger day if Hilton came down with a long game uh, that he dropped on, I don't remember if it was the left or right sideline. Also had a short touchdown pass, so there could have been a bigger day, but 314 passing yards you can't be mad at. And then you look at his rushing upside, right? Brissett's averaging... 21 rushing yards per game in his four starts. And he's tied for the league lead in quarterback rushing touchdowns with three, with Mariota. So if you're giving me a rushing touchdown, he, in three or four games, he has a rushing touchdown, 20 rushing yards, that's a great floor, and plus great upside with the touchdowns, right? And um, he's also averaging 0.47 fantasy points per drop back. So every time he drops back, it's about half a fantasy point, which is tied for 12th among all NFL quarterbacks. So. On an efficiency basis, fantasy-wise, he's right up there in the top 10 to top 12. And, uh, you know, most importantly, they get the Tennessee Titans. They've given up a league-high 12 touchdown passes to opponents through the first five weeks. That's like, I think, 2.4 passing touchdowns a game. Now, while he only has two on the year, this is definitely an opportunity that he could take advantage of and score, you know, two, three passing touchdowns through the air as he gets more comfortable, right? Prior to facing um, arguably the worst starting quarterback in the league on Sunday, Jake Cutler, it has to be said at this point, the Titans you know, have allowed 24 rushing yards to each of their past three quarterbacks they've faced and let up nine total passing touchdowns or nine total touchdowns over the previous two weeks to guys like Russell Wilson, Deshaun Watson, and Jacoby Brissett obviously fits that mold. So we've seen these guys have a lot of success against the Tennessee uh, pass defense. Jacoby Brissett should just get in there and, and kind of do the same thing. So for me, he's one of the best streaming options available. He's not someone I want to spend a lot on the wire for because, you know, after after week seven, he's got a ridiculous matchup against Jacksonville. And then, you know, before we know it, luck will be on the field. But Jacoby Brissett, in my opinion, is an incredible streamer for, for, uh, for week six. Moving on to the running backs. A lot of people are probably frustrated with him, but I'm going Marshawn Lynch. I'm getting him in my lineup in week six. He's not been good of late, right? Not at all. But he's had touch, uh, tough matchups. 
Week three, he was he played against Washington. They were at Washington. No one on that offense played well, right? Cooper was playing like shit. Derek Carr was playing like shit. Washington's front seven is pretty good. They're they're only allowing 3.9 yards per carry to opposing rushers. Only allowing 88 rushing yards a game um, to a, to opposing running backs. So that's a tough matchup for him. Then they played at Denver week four. That they are the best rush defense in the NFL at this point. So I wouldn't expect a big game. Last week, they played Baltimore, another good uh, run defense. They didn't they didn't even have Carr, they had EJ Manuel, so it wasn't hard for the defense to kind of stack the box against Lynch. He still ended up with a pretty good game. He got into the end zone over 50 total yards, so definitely usable. What I'm looking at more so is the fact that those are three losses in a row for them. And those are the games, like bad game script is what's gonna dictate whether or not Lynch is successful on a week to week basis. And they're playing the San Diego Chargers this week. Derek Carr, uh, head coach for the Raiders, said Derek Carr is expected to play week six, which obviously gives them a huge boost. They're playing this Raiders team that's one and four, right? They're allowing five yards a carry to opposing rushers, 161 rushing yards a game to opponents, and they're allowing the sixth most, sixth most fantasy points per game to running backs. So it's a, it's a really, really, really good matchup for running backs that are playing against them in fantasy. With Carr back, you're expecting them to be pretty heavy favorites, right, at home. And you look at the first two games of the Raiders season where they actually won, right? They're two and three, the first two games were wins. Lynch saw 32 touches in those first two games. And I would expect a similar workload in this one, right? Because it should be a positive game script. He should get plenty of carries. And I'm expecting, if, if I had to project Lynch for something, I would say 14 to 16 touches. 70 plus total yards and I think he finds pay dirt as well so Lynch is someone I definitely want to get into my lineup as an RB2 or flex play this week so I'm not sitting Lynch even though he's been kind of uh, more bust mode than beast mode as of late next guy up we pick a wide receiver that is Pierre Garcon of the 49ers Hoyer's coming off a really big passing game right I think it was like 350 yards against the Colts Garcon is absolutely just being, you get a target, you get a target, but you're only Pierre Garcon, peppered with targets on the year. He's easily Brian Hoyer's favorite um, target in this passing offense. And it's not surprising considering how Kyle Shanahan used him back in 2013 when they played together at Washington, right? He is their main guy, and he's going to keep getting hit with uh, targets throughout the year, and especially in this game. They're going against Washington. They're below average pass defense to begin with. But they're going to be without Josh Norman again on Sunday, which is a really, really big boost to a guy like Pierre Garcon, who probably would have seen a lot of him. Now, Garcon is currently 7th in the NFL in targets with 44. He's tied for 8th in catches with 28, and he's 7th in receiving yards with, like, I forget what it was, like 300, uh, 379. So 7th in yards, 7th in targets, 8th in catches. If you pace these numbers out, He's on pace for 90 catches, 1,270 receiving yards on 141 targets. He doesn't have a touchdown yet. So, I mean, I, I never really expected his touchdown upside to really be there for him. But that will come eventually. If Brian Hoyer keeps progressing and keeps having these big passing games and this offense scores, you know, 26 points a game like they did last week, he should end up with three to five touchdowns by the end of the year. He's an absolute monster in PPR with these numbers. They're nine and a half point dogs against the Redskins. There's going to be a lot of throwing involved in this game as 10-point underdogs, over under 47. So a lot of points are expected to be scored. So I really, really, really I like this whole San Francisco offense, right? Brian Hoyer, Pierre Garcon, and my tight end that I really, really like this week is George Kittle. This uh, Redskins team has allowed like the fourth most fantasy points to tight ends on the year. Last week he played, or the third most generous to pass uh, to tight ends to fantasy tight ends on the year, this Redskins defense. They are really bad at defending tight ends. He's coming off a really big week where he had seven catches on nine targets for 83 yards and a touchdown. Uh, he had a lot of hype this offseason, right? George Kittle, they got rid of Vance McDonald because they saw George Kittle as like the future of the tight end position on their on their team. And, you know, he, he hasn't really lived up to that up to date. And you look at his matchups he's had, though, right? It was Carolina week one, Seattle week two, the Rams week three, Cardinals week four. Looking back, those are four really, really, really solid defenses, especially against the tight end. Finally gets a good matchup against the Indy Colts last, last week. And like I said, seven for 83 and a touchdown. So I'm expecting more, more targets going forward for Kittle. And he gets this great matchup against the Redskins. So 
Kittle's a guy that you could definitely stream. You know, if you're a, uh, a Travis Kelsey owner or something like that, or you're just desperate for a tight end, I like Kittle a lot this week. One more uh, tight end I want to add in here is Austin Safarian Jenkins. Talked him up a lot in my waiver wire sheet. Gets the Patriots this year, who are, you know, bottom five against tight ends in fantasy points allowed. They let up that touchdown catch to Brait last week. I thought that was an easy streamer because of just how bad the Pats have been against just the pass, over, the pass overall, but tight ends in general. Um, Austin Sferian Jenkins is just getting absolutely – targets are just sticking to him like fucking spam over there. And uh, he's just becoming the security blanket for McCown. It's like what Gary Barnage was to him when he was in Cleveland. ASJ is becoming that guy, and he's seeing a ton of targets and probably like the number one target in his passing offense. So he gets a really, really, really good uh, matchup against the Patriots this week. So ASJ, another good streamer for you guys. Streaming defenses, I talked about in my waiver wire sheet, so I'm not going to get into it. My favorite two are the, the Falcons at home versus Miami. They're probably getting Vic Beasley back, or he practiced at least this week for the first time since the slight hamstring tear. They are much better at home than they are away, and Miami's obviously just been terrible. So Atlanta, and then you have Washington at home versus the Niners. I know I just talked up that um, the, a lot of the, the offense for the 49ers, but as 10-point favorites, ooh, my leg fell asleep. As 10-point favorites, I like the skins. At, uh, at home, they, they've gotten like eight eight sacks over the last two weeks, and the 49ers are allowing a lot of sacks. So it's it's push comes to shove. The offense, the Niners can still put up a lot of yards and have productive days out of Kittle, Hoyer, and Garcon, but I, I think Washington will have a good day defensively. So those are my must starts. My must sits right now. Basically anyone on the Giants. You can't play anyone on that team against this Denver defense. Big Ben on the road at Kansas City, coming off that five interception performance, like you just can't go anywhere near that uh, near Big Ben on the road. It's, it's like, can you even go after him at home now? I don't even know. It doesn't look good. That's definitely a decrease for like Martavis Bryant. Obviously, you're not sitting Antonio Brown, but yeah, Big Ben on the road, I would stay away from him. Uh, Jared Goff, that Rams offense against Jack. They're at Jacksonville. Uh, you can't start Jared Goff. Not that anyone was gonna. I don't need to tell you. You don't need to start Sammy Watkins. I actually low key kind of like Cooper Cup a little bit running out of the slot against the Jacksonville defense because their corners on the outside are ridiculous, right? AJ Bowie and Jalen Ramsey, but they they can be susceptible to uh, success over over the middle in the slot. So if you're gonna play anyone in this Rams offense uh, in the receiving game, it's got to be Cooper Cup. Must sits. Who else? Oh, Dougie Martin. Not a mu I'm not saying he's a must sit because most people don't have the luxury of doing that. But you know, if you have other good options, I would suggest probably playing them over Doug Martin, or at least move him to like a flex play or something like that. Because you know they're on the road. They're at Arizona. That's a really really tough matchup. They've allowed the fifth fewest fantasy points to running backs. They're allowing 3.3 yards per carry to opposing runners. They haven't allowed more than 27 receiving yards to an opponent running back. So they're not letting running backs get it done on the ground. They're not letting running backs get it done through the air. And uh, Martin's one of those versatile players that could do both. But if they're not letting him do either of them, you know, then you, you kind of have to sit back. And if this team gets down, there's a decent chance that Charles Sims kind of comes in. And he's that, like, two-minute drill guy. He'll, receive a, he'll see a lot of receiving work. So I'm a little off on, on Martin. You know, Zeke is the only running back that has even hit 80 rushing yards on this uh, Arizona defense, and he needed 22 carries to do it. So unless Martin, you know, explodes for like a big play, then he probably won't. I, I wouldn't imagine him getting more than like 60 to 70 total yards in this game. And it was the same thing I said with Carlos Hyde a couple weeks ago against his Arizona defense, and it kind of played out just like that. Um, what other? I, I, I don't really love LeGarrette Blunt here either, even if Smallwood sits. This Carolina defense is legit. No running back has even hit 60 rushing yards on them. Where they are susceptible is uh, pass-catching running backs. They haven't had a game yet this year out of the five games where they haven't let up at least 30 receiving yards to a single running back. So in every game, there's been at least one running back on the other team that has 30 receiving yards. And there's been, you know, it's been 30, 45, a few times, 50, something like that. But obviously, Blunt is not the uh, receiving back in Philly. He's not going to get those targets and those receptions. So if he can't get it done on the ground, then he's not someone that you really want to play. Again, though, most people might not have the luxury, and you could do worse than Blunt. I'm just, I'm just giving you the facts that this Panthers D is good, and they don't let up a lot of rushing yards. 
Um, staying with Philly, though, I'm also nervous about Carson Wentz a little bit, right? This this Carolina pass defense is very legit as well. They're like top top six in the league yards per attempt, um, and they will be without their left tackle Lane Johnson for Sunday. It looks like, and according to Adam Leviton, who's looked at the splits. Carson Wentz is, for some reason, I mean, not for some reason, it makes sense, but his splits are a lot worse with more of like a high-end QB2 than the, like the top six or top eight guy you've kind of gotten a few times this year from Wentz. So that'll wrap up my must-starts, must-sits. Let's look over to sell-high guys. Buck Allen is numero uno. Bucky. Buck, Buck. I actually dropped Buck Allen two weeks ago in two of my leagues, and I wish I didn't do that. Like we're really using that running back right now. Um, sell hot. I'm not selling him right now. I would sell him after the Chicago game. Because, like I said, if Terrence West is out, Buck Allen's going to get a huge workload. We saw it last week. They clearly just trust Buck Allen down by the goal line. They, they trust him to close the game out, not fumble in between the tackles. But he's been terrible, especially compared to Alex Collins, right? Over seven yards a carry for Alex Collins, 3.5 yards per carry for Buck Allen. And he's not good in the receiving game. He'll catch the ball, but he literally doesn't do anything with it. 4.9 yards per reception. So I'm looking at running backs, qualified running backs, uh, running backs with at least 47 carries on the year. There's 26 of them. His uh, Allen's yards per carry is 3.5 yards per carry is ranked 19th out of 26. His yards per reception among backs with at least eight catches on the year, 39, 39 backs have at least eight catches on the year. His 4.9 yards per reception is 38th out of 39th. So you can't do you can't do worse than what he's doing with with his reception. So while the volume is there, if he doesn't score a touchdown, he's not giving you more than like eight points. That's it in in standard leagues. And of course, it's a little bit of a bump in PPR leagues because he's the only pass catcher there. So I would say if you're um, Buck owner, West is probably going to be out this week. Let him kind of go off or let him have like a decent game against Chicago and then try to sell sell him high if you can. Uh, next up, we have Ty Montgomery, obviously, uh, for obvious reasons. He's been on my, my sell high list for the last like two or three weeks. Aaron Jones busted out, right? 19, uh, 19 rushes, 125 yards, a touchdown along with some receiving work. He just looked awesome. He's looked way better running the ball in that game than at any point Ty Montgomery did throughout the year. Ty Montgomery's been ridiculously inefficient running the ball, especially on a yards per carry basis. I know Aaron Jones did it against the Cowboys and it was a Sean Lee-less defense. I don't care what you say though, he passed the eye test for me. He's one of those like Kareem Hunt kind of guys where the, you know, he actually, Aaron Jones is like a spark freak. He's like a very, very good athlete and his measurables are very good. But he, where he excels is the vision, the cutbacks, the, the balance, things like that. So those are guys you want to keep around because people might not be very high on him, but those intangibles make him a great running back. When Taimon's back, we don't even know if he's going to be back. I'm assuming he'll push himself because he doesn't want to lose his starting job here. I think at, at best for Taimon, he's splitting carries with Aaron, early down carries with Aaron Jones, 45-55, something like that. Uh, receiving work, Taimon will probably still get a lot of work, but I'm just saying, if you could sell high on Taimon just on his name right now, maybe someone's like, oh, when Taimon Montgomery's back, he's getting that job back, no doubt. Try to sell to him because um, because Aaron Jones is to me clearly the best runner in that in that backfield, and you can't you can't disagree with that. And, and uh, Mike McCarthy came out and said Aaron Jones obviously earned more work. Obviously, hmm. Buy low, some buy lows. I got like four of them here. Jesus Christmas. Um, I hope y'all listened to me last week. Mark Ingram, baby, without AP. All right, I, I guess I got to talk about AP and Ingram real quick. I would say for me. Uh, this is a huge boost to Ingram, a big boost to Kamara as well. But you got to realize, like AP was getting, I think it was seven point two or seven point five touches a game over their first four, four or five games. Or they had a buy, so first four games, split that up evenly, right? Three and a half this way, three and a half that way. Kamara, Ingram, Ingram was already dominating in touches. Kamara had like eight carries over the last three games. So where Peterson left most of his work, which is obviously in the running game. I would say, like, if the seven carries were going to be split up, it would more so go to, to Ingram, right? He's the primary early down runner, and their receiving work is going to be split. So, for me, this just solidifies Ingram as a as an RB2, a really solid RB2. It's obviously a small boost to Kamara, but it's not as big for Kamara as it is for Ingram. And on the AP side, obviously, they cut CJ. <laughs> Did uh, <laughs> If you guys follow me on Twitter, I retweeted this. It was like... Um, uh, I actually didn't see the date. I think it was like very, I think it was like a couple days ago. Chris Johnson 
tweeted, he was like, damn, AP need more carries. And then, like, the NFL re- retweeted it and quote tweeted it. It was like, life comes at you fast. It was like, CJ, CJ said AP needs more carries. Next day, you're cut for AP. It's like Bruce Arians, like, read it. He's like, yeah, buddy. Um, CJ gone. AP obviously takes that early down work. CJ's been getting, like, a decent amount of work, right? He's going to get a lot more... Uh, AP is going to get a lot more work in Arizona than he was getting in New Orleans, of course. But they're still in a really bad offense. Or their offensive line is really bad. It's not going to be a good ground game. Andre Allington is still the back to own there, regardless of um, regardless of format. Because even if it's just rushing, uh, even if it's just standard, Ellington's putting up a ton of yards through the air. And you look at, let me pull up Chris Johnson's numbers real quick, sorry. Give me like two seconds, bros. Bros. Serena went to tell my bros. Then a Serena let it burn game on. So Chris Johnson has 45 carries through four games, right? It was 11 carries week two, 12 week three, 13 week four, only nine week five, but that was probably because they were trailing the entire game. So I'm expecting AP to get somewhere between... 10 and, 10 and 14 carries a game. And I'm in the small minority here that I don't think AP was done. To me, he didn't have a lot of room to run on his rushes in New Orleans. And I think, like, let him get in a zone, and I think he's going to bust off a couple big ones. What I would love is for AP to bust one out this week, like a 60-yard touchdown run where he gets through the line and just, you know, fucking goes. And then next week everyone's like, oh, AP's like the top waiver wire ad. I would definitely add him, like a speculative ad in standard leagues. Um, he won't get any receiving work really there with Andre Ellington, but 10 to 15 carries a week in an offense that hopefully can move the ball. I mean, they're not a great scoring offense, but it wouldn't surprise me if Adrian Peterson, even behind this shitty line, his yards per carry get like a big boost. Because I don't think he's lost it, but I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. Anyways, by low, Mark Cooper is my number one guy. He is one of seven wide receivers in NFL history that started his career with back-to-back 1,000-yard seasons. The talent is not arguable. You know, once Carr is back, which is expected to be this week, I think Cooper is fine. I think he's going to be absolutely fine. I know the drops have been bad. That was something that's hard to predict because, you know, his rookie year at 18, which, like, led the NFL. Last year, he dropped it down to five. No pun intended. He dropped his drops from 18 to five, and you're like, oh, well, you know what? He's done with the, uh, with the drop issue, and now it's coming back again, and he's just been terrible catching the ball. And, like... I, I don't know. I'm on the side. I'm worth, I, for me, it's worth risking the, the drop issue uh, because it's not like the drops are leading to any less playing time for him. And you look at the last last three games, right? They played at Washington where Carr played terrible, Cooper played terrible, saw Josh Norman. Um, then week four, played against Denver, and no, no wide receiver is going to be doing well against Denver. Week five, they had EJ Manuel. So I, I feel like he's been awful the last few weeks, but there's very, very reasonable like explanations as to why I think that is and I think once Carr is back Cooper is going to be fine he's going to be a fine wide receiver too he's going to continue to get targets continue to make plays he is the big playmaker there he gets a ton of deep targets obviously not the the end zone and the red zone option that Crabtree is but I'm not selling on on Cooper I'm not dropping him Um, and you could probably buy him for like dimes on the dollar right now so Cooper's one of my favorite buy lows Ajayi is another one of my buy lows. I actually debated putting him on a sell high, but I'm going to say buy low if you can. Um, don't like I'm when I say buy when I say buy low, I'm not like don't offer up like Michael Thomas for Jay Ajayi. I'm talking about like a lower. I would go Demarius Thomas for Jay Ajayi in a second right now. The problem isn't Jay Ajayi. The problem is everyone else. The problem is this offense as a whole, right? Per PFF, they just let out a new uh, article today like the top ranked offensive lines through five weeks. The Dolphins are allowing just .66 yards before contact on rushes. So they, Ajayi can't even get a yard without being hit behind the line of scrimmage, which ranks 29th in the NFL. But he's still getting a ton of touches, right? He had 27 touches last game. <coughs> His yards per carry over the last three games have been really bad, right? 2.9 yards per carry, but he's averaging 2.5 yards after contact. And he's averaging 0.21 tackles avoided per attempt. Both of those are ranked very, very high uh, in that in that time span. Like it, he's getting hit behind the line, and he can't 
overall he can't get a high yard per carry, but what he's doing, he's one of the top rated elusive running backs per PFF. He's making guys miss and he's able to drag defenders and he's getting yards after contact. So for me, if you're gonna get these carries, if you're gonna get this workload and you're doing it all yourself, right? You're able to, to make guys miss. He's dominating the backfield. He's getting the most snaps, most touches. He's on pace for 332 touches on the season. And I wouldn't be surprised if he, if he finished around there, right? Like 300 to 315 touches. You want a guy like that on your team. His next few matchups, you know, over the, the rest of the season, he still gets Atlanta, the Jets, Oakland, Tampa Bay, New England twice. So he's got a lot of good matchups left. Getting the workload, I know it's going to be hard to come by touchdowns, but if you can if you could buy him for really low right now, I would definitely suggest doing so because he's not the RB1, the high-end RB1 that a lot of people expected, but the workload gives him a really like a really nice RB2 floor. And if he gets a touchdown, then he's going to put up RB1 numbers on a week-to-week basis. Um, I got two more by lows, two wide receivers, Kelvin Benjamin, Alshon Jeffrey. Kelvin Benjamin, I mean, I guess, you know, Cam is fully back, right? And if Cam's fully back, Kelvin Benjamin is, is a very good fantasy option. Over the last two weeks, uh, he has eight catches, 162 yards, one touchdown, and those are like the two weeks that Cam has been basically at full strength. Now, while everyone is focusing on like Devin Funches and this breakout from him on the outside, They've both been really good, right? Funches is like wide receiver four over the last two weeks, but but Kelvin's also like a top 10 fantasy wide receiver over the last couple weeks. And uh, he has a 43% end zone target share for his team. 43% of the targets that are going into the end zone are to Kelvin Benjamin. That's seventh highest in the NFL among all, among all receivers. He's 21st in air yards on the season, so he's getting a lot of deep plays as well. There's just a lot of good, you know, maybe not everything is translating into numbers right now, but there's a lot of good signs that it will pick up. And as, you know, as Cam gets healthier and healthier, Kelvin Benjamin should continue to put up really good name, uh, good games, really good schedule down the stretch. They have 10 games remaining, right, in the fantasy season, at least up to week 16. Uh, six of them are home games. The four away games are the Saints, the Jets, Chicago, and Tampa Bay. So just a very, very, very friendly matchup going forward. Uh, I think he's a rock solid uh, wide receiver too, from this point to the rest of the season. So K. Benz is definitely a guy I'm looking to buy low if possible. And I think he's not necessarily a buy low guy, but I think people are so high on Funches right now that you can kind of probably sneak in in Benjamin as a trade target. And lastly, like I said, Alshon Jeffrey. Basically, he just had a brutal, brutal, brutal slate of. Um, of cornerback matchups so far. It's Josh Norman, Marcus Peters, the Giants, Casey Hayward, Patrick Peterson. And he gets easier matchups as the season goes on. He gets Carolina this week. Uh, it's a zone defense, so there should be openings for Jeffrey to run through on the outside. Um, probably a, a Josh Norman list, Washington the next week, and then San Francisco. His week 16, 16 which is you know championship week for fantasy football, is home versus Oakland. Great matchup. I mean, Jeffrey, you know, he's not producing all the numbers, but he has 38 targets on the year, which is on pace for 122 through 16 games. If you told me that in the beginning of the year, Alshon Jeffrey is going to get 122 targets in this offense, I'd be like, perfect, sign me up. He's a very, you know, probably a very solid wide receiver too. The matchups are what's killing him, but they get easier as it goes. The numbers are still there. Wentz has been absolutely on fire. This offense throws the ball a ton, right? The passing volume is always going to be there. So Jeffrey's a guy I really also like to buy low because he hasn't put up huge games, but he I think he will. I think the games are coming. I mean, rest of season, I think I would take probably um, Kel Kelvin Benjamin over Alshon Jeffrey, but I would like either of those guys if, um, if I was offered them. So that wraps that up. Let's move over to, uh, to my Fantasy League recaps which I do every week to let you guys know how I'm doing. Again, just to let you know, I'm in four money leagues. I have the E-Town Get Down League. I have the Subscriber League, my College Friends League, and the Fantasy Jocks Office League. E-Town Get Down League took a huge dub while also taking a huge L this week. I lost OBJ, my first round pick. Devastating. Absolutely. Like, I saw it happen, and I just immediately was like, wow, my season just went absolutely down the toilet. But I got the win. I went into Monday Night Football. I was up like seven and a half points on my opponent. He had Latavius Murray going. Seven and a half points. This is 0.5 PPR, also 0.5 points per first down. 
and you only needed seven and a half from Latavius Murray. I'm like, there's a zero percent chance I could win. Thank the fantasy gods. Thank you, Jarek McKinnon. Thank you, Action Bronson. Thank you, Monster, even though you won't sponsor me. Thank you, everything. I ended up winning by like point. Three points. It was ridiculous. But I'm sitting at three and two in the E-Town Get Down League, despite losing OBJ, Allen Robinson, Chris Carson, Danny Woodhead, now Charles Clay, who's my backup tight end, but still. So a ton of injuries, still sitting at three and two. Uh, so I'll tell you, you just gotta keep on keeping on, man. You just gotta do it. I just got offered a trade in that league, actually. It was uh Jordan Howard, Delaney Walker, Julio Jones, and then and Deshaun Watson for my Breeze, Travis Kelsey, and DeMarco Murray. I turned it down. It was very hard, but in my opinion, Breeze and Watson, for me, it's not close going forward. Like Watson, I know Watson's look amazing, and he's going to be like a top 10 quarterback for sure going forward. But like three of his passes, three of his big plays were just like chuck it and hope that someone comes down with it, which is, I mean, he's got DeAndre Hopkins, so it's not a terrible idea, but those aren't always going to break his way. And like every single one of those have been breaking his way so far. The six point pass touchdown league as well as 20 yards per point instead of 25. So Breeze is super valuable in this league. Also, Travis Kelsey is like my, probably my most valuable player on the team now that OBJ is down. So I didn't want to give up Kelsey. And I think that DeMarco bounces back once uh, Marcus Mariota is back in the lineup because the split between him and Henry is no longer a split. It's DeMarco dominating, but it's hard to be efficient with Matt Castle there. So I turned it down. I don't know. Hopefully I won't regret that. Um, my subscriber league. I'm hurting a little bit at two and three. Uh, I lost OBJ. I've lost Chris Carson there. I, I've been getting killed at tight end because I picked Jordan Reed and he, you know, he hasn't been able to do shit for me. So it's a 14 team league and it's hard to get a backup tight end on the wire. So sitting at two and three, that's the worst league I'm in. My college league, I'm one in four, but I have the second most points in the entire league. I've just had a shitload of points scored against me. So a couple wins, I'm not, I'm not getting down on that. Um, a couple wins and I'll be right back in the, in the playoff hunt there. Fantasy Jocks League, I took a dub. I'm in fourth place out of 14. Um, that's not bad. I picked up Jarek McKinnon on the wire two weeks ago, so that worked out well. That's a sharp league, so it's hard to get guys on the wire. Um, but I'm sitting pretty there, so that'd be nice. And I didn't even have Gronk playing last week. Still took the dub. So overall, overall, the records aren't great, but for the most part, E-Town Get Down, the College League, and the Fantasy Jocks League, I'm right there. My sub league that I lost OBJ in, I still have um, Keenan Allen, uh, Chris Hogan, and I think another good wide receiver. So I had enough depth that the OBJ thing is not going to kill me, um, but it definitely hurts a little bit. A lot of season left. Just got to keep on keeping on, baby. And then my locks of the century, as we always do for y'all gambling folks, where I pick a few games. I've picked three each week up to this point. I just pick either the spreads, the over-unders, or the money line or whatever. After last week's games, I'm five and six on the season. I apologize if anyone actually takes these. I don't I don't advise you to actually take these bets. Like, don't put money on these games. I'm not a professional gambler. But, you know, coming up, I went one and two last week. That's why I'm under 500 now. It was the first... Actually, no. Yeah. I'm one and two, I went one and two last week, so I'm five and six on the season. I'm going with six picks this week. I have six separate picks this week that I'm going to go with. I've only done three each week up to this point, but I'm feeling spicy. I'm feeling a big comeback week. I'm feeling like I'm going to hit at least four of these games. So let's get it. I have the first one, Detroit at New Orleans, over 49 and a half. This is going to be a shootout. Detroit got murked by the Panthers last week. New Orleans defense is no good. They're at the dome. The points fly. The players fly. The deep balls fly. Everybody's flying. We're flying past 49 and a half points. That's number one. Number two, San Francisco at Washington over 46 and a half. Both of these teams have been passing the ball lights out the last couple games. Without Norman, uh, San Francisco defense is already no good. Washington doesn't have Norman. I think there's going to be a lot of points scored in this game as well. So 46 and a half, I take the over there. I also take San Fran plus 10 points. They're getting 10 points in Washington. So, like I said, I like Brian Hoyer, Pierre Garçon, George Kittle, all to have good games. I think they could stay within 10 points in this game. Rams at Jacksonville, under 42 and a half. This Jacksonville defense at home is just stifling. You can't do shit against them. And uh, I, I, the Rams defense is pretty good as well. So neither of these offenses really impressed me. These defenses are both very good. I like under 42 and a half. New England at the Jets over 47 and a half. These are always, these are always, I mean, they actually keep it pretty close, uh, the Jets do when they're at home. Um, but again, neither of these defenses are particularly good. I like, 
I mean, I feel like the, the Patriots are probably going to score like 35 points, so all we need is the Jets to score about 13. I think we can get it done. So over 47 and a half there. And now I'm taking Cleveland plus 10 at Houston. They've been bad. Cleveland obviously 0-5, but Houston losing both J.J. Watt, um, Mars, uh, whoever the other guy they lost on defense is a big loss. So their defense is definitely not going to be as good as it usually is. So I like the Browns to have, have a sneaky game. All they got to do is stay within 10 points. So I like that. Um, you know, Deshaun Watson, while they're putting up a ton of points, like I said, everything is bouncing their way. So I expect some of them not to bounce their way. I like Cleveland to stay within 10 points. And that is a lock to the century, baby. And that wraps up the video for week six. If you enjoyed, please go scroll down a little bit. Give it that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We do these videos every week. And make sure you are subscribed to the newsletter on my site. Again, go over to bdgeat.com. On the homepage, just scroll down, put your info in. You will get an email when the waiver wire sheet hits, the, the murky running back situation hits, which you guys can go check out. Basically, just breaks down last week's splits between any running backs that are kind of in committees. You guys will like that. It's very informative. Go check that out, as well as uh, the wide receiver cornerback matchups, which will be on the site probably by Thursday uh, between noon and 2 p.m. So, so yeah, go do all that stuff. Follow me on Twitter. I have the podcast with fantasy football advice Thursday nights. That will be out probably Friday. Um, so thank you for joining me again, and I will see you all on my vlog on Saturday. That's it. Peace, baby.